The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who dwell therein. By the end of chapter 6, Dan was an old man in his 80s or 90s. He had lived his whole life trapped in a foreign empire. He had survived four tumultuous regime changes serving one tyrant after another. He had survived a lot of crazy and a lot of horror over those eight or nine decades. Yet he still had impeccable integrity and he still trusted in God. In fact, he was well known for these things. After a restructuring government bureaucracy to guard against corruption, it seems that the incumbents were a little bit tetchy because they couldn't get away with what they used to get away with on, uh, now that Daniel was on watch. A corrupt Middle Eastern government needing to tidy up its act? No, that'd never be the case, would it? Dan was doing it cleaner and better than the other guys and they resented the hell out of him and as such, he was on the verge, because he was doing it cleaner than everyone else, he was on the verge of a promotion to a position of almost ultimate power, second only to the emperor himself. There was no dirt on this bloke. So they attacked him and his faith and used it against him. These ladder climbers and speech police cooked up a scheme to bring him down, using his religion against him whilst pandering to the ego of the emperor. Oh, you know, let's press pause on worship for 30 days and let everyone worship you. That'll be wonderful, won't it? Every time Dan had been under threat in his life or in dire need, when his life was on the line, he trusted God enough to still put him first, no matter what. To go back to him in prayer. This occasion was no different. Dan had no intention of discontinuing his staple daily diet of prayer, morning, noon and night. Sure, he could have kept his mouth shut or his window shut for the month until this ridiculous law lapsed, but that wasn't his style. Dan didn't take it to the streets in protest or take up arms or use his position to undermine the emperor. Instead, he just goes about his normal daily routines. And that was his protest. Prayer was his protest. And what was his prayer? For mercy. You've got to ask yourself, who was he praying for mercy for? Just himself? Given his character, I wonder if he was praying for mercy for his enemies as well. Well, the ladder climbers and speech police caught him out in his own home, looking through his windows. Non-compliance drives evil regimes crazy because it makes them look bad. It makes them look ridiculous and ineffective. Physical compliance is never enough though. They must have your total unswerving obedience to the point where you will police your own thoughts and your own speech so they don't have to lift a finger. Some of you may remember the story of Manal Al-Sharif and her book, Daring to Drive. She talks about how the oppressive atmosphere of the Islamic Kingdom of Saudi Arabia pushes people to suppress their own thoughts and words. You know, this was a woman who dared to drive despite the law being that no women should ever be allowed to drive or do much of anything without having a man to chaperone her. And she paid a terrible price for it. Ali Al-Janabi, author of The People Smuggler, wrote of his life growing up in Saddam Hussein's Bathurst, Iraq. And he reflected on how members of families would dob each other to the secret police so that no one was going to say a word out of place ever, even in the privacy of their own home, because they might be arrested and tortured by the secret police to get their compliance. Trust in that society had been completely corroded to nothing. But it's not only in those places that these kinds of things 
occur. In May this year, David Pello from Church and State Ministries was speaking at an event in Queensland set up by the Australian Christian Lobby. Back in May, he was asked at this event why he had begun it by reading the Bible verse we had at the start of the service. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Rather than beginning with the welcome to country ceremony. His answer was this. My answer to that was an explanation of the duty of Christians to preach the truth and gospel and not to mix Christianity with false religion, such as the Aboriginal traditional religion, which is bearing all the hallmarks of animism and paganism, end quote. Well, whether you agree with him or not on that point, he is a Christian speaker speaking at a Christian event, asked to give a Christian answer to why he did something. It's the equivalent of going into your own home and praying with the windows open. Yet now, come August, Mr. Pello has been ordered to appear before the Queensland Human Rights Commission to give an account because he somehow offended someone with his answer. He follows in the footsteps of another Queenslander, Christian speaker Lyle Shelton from my hometown of Toowoomba, who fought the Queensland Human Rights Commission for three and a half years at a personal cost of $300,000 and having to put his work on hold because he questioned on his blog the uh, whether it's a good thing to have drag queen story time in his local library. A couple of drag queens got offended and took him to the Human Rights Commission and tried to destroy him and his reputation. And just this year as well, comedian Isaac Butterfield, now I could question whether he's a comedian or not, but um, he followed a similar path and thankfully he got some free legal help to find his way through this minefield. Like them or loathe these men, they were speaking what they believed to be the right thing in context without malice. But they found themselves like Daniel going home to pray with the windows open. Like Daniel, there's always someone watching to stitch you up, especially if you are a Christian in the public eye. And they will seek to toss you to the lions, falling into the jaws of Queensland's Human Rights Commission is like falling into a pit of lions. The process is the punishment as you'll either give up and comply, go to prison or die in the process. There is a cadre of self-appointed culture police out there, just like those Babylonian officials who are seeking to catch people out who have weaponized organizations like the Queensland Human Rights Commission, which were established in the first place to guard against this kind of insanity. And they use these organizations in order to destroy people who challenge or defy political correctness and the woke agenda. This kind of thing isn't new in our society, but it is becoming more commonplace and it will just keep on coming unless people stand against it. The COVID lockdowns proved that Western governments could effectively restrain our daily activities and they didn't barely have to lift a finger. We policed ourselves. Here in Victoria, churches were amongst the first to be ordered to be shut down and the last organisations allowed out into the open. And we bowed down in fearful submission. It wasn't enough that they restricted our movements. Never forget Zoe Bueller, just days away from giving birth in September 2020, found her home filled up with police who were terrorising her while she was still in her pyjamas and then arrested her for what? For some Facebook posts about how she felt about the lockdowns. According to Constantine Kissin, free speech advocate and commentator in England, in Russia in 2021, 400 people were arrested for social media posts. 
Social media is like the modern equivalent of going home and praying with the windows open, or at least one of them, right? So in Great Britain, the world's preeminent democracy, which basically has set the standard for world democracy, that same year, 2021, how many people do you think were arrested for social media posts? Hey. What's that? Hey. A million. Well, I don't know if they, I don't know if they've got enough room in prison for a million. <laughs> three thousand three hundred people. They were worse than the Russians. Three thousand three hundred people. Many of them were convicted for what you and I would consider trivialities, just putting their thoughts out there in one way or another. Some Christians fined, imprisoned, put on good behaviour orders for years on end, and some even having ankle bracelets put on them for an indefinite period of time to monitor their activities. The country that gave us the Magna Carta a document based on the biblical idea that all human beings are created free and equal and the foundation of our modern systems of government around the world and the basis of universal human rights, this country is on the verge of evil. Not far away from that of ancient Babylon. Some preachers share things like this because they want you to be afraid, suspicious or reactionary. No, we need to be prepared. We know from early church history and from the news today that God doesn't always shut the mouths of lions or deliver Christians from the plots of evil men. Christians can and will continue to suffer and to die for their faith. But this episode dares us to lifelong dogged perseverance, to knowing that we may never see the fullness of freedom or the new day dawn in this flesh and blood. It dares us to defy the spirit of our age surrounding us in our society, dares us to defy this spirit in the face of every threat that is raised. And it dares us to pray and to pray for mercy for our enemies and for ourselves. To defiantly speak out the truth that the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. And every person that populates this planet. To speak the truth that Jesus is the only way, the truth and the life. The only way to salvation. And there is no other. In this age, maintaining your staple diet of Sunday worship, midweek Bible study or fellowship group, maintaining your commitment to come to prayer or fellowship will become a daring act of defiance against the tyrants of this age. Praying over your food in a public place, singing Christmas carols down the street or maybe even praying in your own backyard will become acts of humble defiance against the darkness. You and I know that there are worse things than death. Just like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego said, if our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O King, let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O King, that we will not bow down. We will not do what you have commanded. Today we arrive at what is essentially the end of the book of Daniel. The rest of the chapters, 7 to 12, actually rewind us to a series of visions that Daniel had throughout his life and ministry in Babylon that informed his actions and his prayer life. We end here in chapter 6 with a foreshadowing, though, of Jesus' death and resurrection. Just like in Jesus' day, the religious and political leaders of Babylon were driven crazy with jealousy about Daniel 
and they could never catch him out in a word or anything he did. Just like Jesus, they couldn't get down on any charges except against the emperor. Just like Jesus, Dan prays for mercy, knowing that the enemy is coming for him. And just like Jesus, they sentence Dan to death and lock him in with a powerful and ferocious animal that symbolizes the Satan. They roll the stone across the entryway, thinking Dan's been devoured, dead and buried. Job's right, no more of him. And at dawn, Dan walks out untouched, just like Jesus, to their dismay and judgment. God will be with us through the most harrowing things this life can throw at us. God does not guarantee that we will be delivered from danger or suffering, but God will deliver us from death itself and will roll the stone away on the last day so that with Daniel and with Jesus, we may walk out alive and untouched. And to that I say, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let us pray.